On the 10th of April, 1829, William Booth was born in this small house in Nottingham, England. The house, which is still standing, is one of a row of terraced dwellings known as Nottington Place. This street was on the outskirts of the city in William Booth's young days. But now, Nottingham has spread out and engulfed the nearby fields. In this Wesleyan Methodist chapel, at the age of 15, he was converted to that life which, in the service of God, was to lead to the founding of the Salvation Army. It was in this room, beneath the chapel, that William Booth knelt at a table and prayed. He afterwards said, I wanted to be right with God. I wanted to be right in myself. I wanted a life spent in putting other people right. Today, a plaque is set in the floor to mark this spot. In 1852, William Booth was ordained as a minister in the Methodist New Connection. This portrait was presented to him by his friends in appreciation of his arduous work in Sheffield and elsewhere. It was during his period as a Methodist minister that he married Catherine Mumford, who became his beloved wife and never-failing helper. She was afterwards to become known as the Mother of the Salvation Army. But the Reverend William Booth's continued emphasis on evangelical work, which he insisted in putting before all else, conflicted with the views of the majority of the members of the Methodist New Connection. At the conference in 1861, limitations were placed upon his freedom which he felt he could not accept. But it was Mrs. Booth who dramatically clinched matters. Leaping to her feet in the gallery, she cried, Never! William Booth responded immediately, for she had echoed his own thoughts, and heedless of the cries of order, they both left the conference. After seven years' devoted service, William Booth had resigned to retain his freedom of action. A series of events followed which ultimately led to his going to London. One evening, as he was passing the Blind Beggar public house on Mile End Waste, he saw a group of gospel missioners concluding a meeting. Their leader asked if any bystander would like to have a word, and William Booth accepted. He addressed the meeting, and so profound was the impression he made upon the crowd that he was invited to take temporary charge of the mission. He accepted the invitation. Meetings were held in a tent in a Quaker burial ground off Whitechapel, in those days an extremely rough quarter of London. Some two or three hundred unkempt, odorous, poorly clad people belonging to the lost land of the East End would gather here. William Booth's commanding figure and forceful words immediately challenged attention, and godless, heedless crowds packed the tent despite the fact that roughs slashed it with knives and on more than one occasion cut the guy ropes, bringing it down upon those within. But winter came, cold, chilly winds blew in through rents in the tent onto the people, and the congregation declined. Other meeting places had to be found. Meetings were held in theatres on Sunday nights, and various other buildings were used as a temporary expedient. In 1864 came the turning point in the mission's history. A beer shop known as the Eastern Star was acquired and converted into permanent headquarters. This picture from the cover of the report of the Christian Mission in 1867 shows this building after the conversion. It provides also the first evidence of the use of flags. The flag flying over the building may be said to be the forerunner of the flags used in the Salvation Army today. A notice on the front of the building throws interesting light on the activities of William Booth at this time. He was, by now, General Superintendent of the Mission. Inside, a large room built for an American bowling saloon seated 300 people and was crowded to the doors every evening of the week. By 1869, the mission had a number of branches, but it still had no central hall. A building known as the People's Market had recently been erected on the Whitechapel Road, where cheap provisions of all kinds were sold. The venture was not successful, and William Booth appealed for funds to purchase the property and turn it into a mission hall. In due course, this was done. The shop at the front was operated as a soup kitchen. It was characteristic of William Booth that he insisted on a wooden floor for the mission hall instead of an asphalt one, saying, poor people feel the cold quite as much if not more than do the rich people. No one gets a blessing if they have cold feet, and nobody ever got saved while they had toothache. It was unfortunate that William Booth was prevented from conducting the opening service through illness, but Mrs. Booth preached instead. Summing up the advantages provided by the new premises, William Booth wrote, they formed the best adapted pile of buildings for evangelistic work in the three kingdoms. 
Oh, may we have grace to use them for good to the very uttermost. Meanwhile, the family life of William and Catherine Booth was proceeding. Here we see them in the year 1862 with five of their children. Standing between father and mother is Bramwell Booth, later to become the second general of the Salvation Army. The Christian mission grew steadily, as this picture of the members of the conference in 1877 suggests. By now, the stations numbered 36, and the work had spread to many centres outside London. In the centre of the group is William Booth. In the year 1878, what appeared to be a small incident developed into a momentous happening. The front page of the printer's proof of the mission's 1878 report and appeal bore the words, The Christian Mission under the superintendence of the Reverend William Booth, is a volunteer army. William Booth was studying the proof in his bedroom with Bramwell and Railton. Bramwell, on seeing the phrase volunteer army, said, Here, I'm no volunteer, I'm a regular or nothing. At this, William Booth looked at his son, took up his pen and struck out the word volunteer. For it, he substituted salvation. This was the first appearance of the description Salvation Army. Out of that conference and by the hand of William Booth, came the inspiration which gave the organization a striking name, wholly descriptive of its purpose and character, the appropriateness of which has never been questioned. With a change of name officially confirmed in 1878, a military form of government was adopted. A natural step was the adoption of a military uniform also. At first, as this picture of the Exeter Corps in 1880 shows, there was a great variety in the styles worn by the various individuals. In 1883, William Booth, now beginning to be universally referred to as the General, called attention to the greatly increased value of uniform with every fresh growth of the Army's publicity. Old photographs have been preserved too, showing how music was taken up by the soldiers of the Army during the 1880s. Here is the Fry family, famous among early Army musicians who formed the first band. The General, who had always been a great lover of music, wrote at this time, Music is to the soul what wind is to a ship blowing her onwards in the direction in which she is steered. Typical of the time is the concert corps band. Vocal music, too, underwent a fundamental change at this time, the word hymn being dropped in favour of the term Salvation Army Song. Members of this speaking, singing and praying brigade include Emma and Evangeline Booth. With the advent of bands and singing brigades on a wide scale, music had become so important that the General established a musical department. Richard Slater with a violin, Henry Hill and Fred Fry, the first staff, were charged with the job of making the best use of music in the army. This drawing shows Whitechapel Band on parade. In 1881, army headquarters was moved to 101 Queen Victoria Street in the city of London, a building destined to remain the home of the headquarters staff for 60 years, until it was destroyed by fire as a result of enemy action in May 1941. Shortly afterwards, the London Orphan Asylum at Lower Clapton was acquired to become the Congress Hall and Training Barracks, another great and important step forward. The building contained a large hall capable of accommodating several thousand persons and two large wings for the training of cadets. soldiers, the general wrote, the nation is now awakening to our existence. Everywhere we are being called for. Expeditionary forces went out first in February 1880 to the United States and within a year to Australia and France, followed shortly afterwards by Canada, Switzerland, India and Ceylon, Sweden, South Africa and New Zealand. Photographs have come down to us of some of these pioneers who went out into many lands. Here are the lassies who sailed to America with Commissioner Railton in 1880. And this sketch depicts an early meeting in the United States. The pioneers who went to Sweden did wonderful work. In India, the first Salvationists adopted Indian clothing in order that they could approach the people as brothers. In 1886, the first International Congress took place in London, and 19 countries and colonies in which the army's flag had been unfurled were represented. The General and Mrs. Booth gave addresses expressing gratitude to God for what he had helped the army to achieve. Throughout the long, hard years during which William Booth had struggled, Catherine Booth had worked beside him, 
conducting meetings, organizing, giving wise counsel until she earned the proud title of Mother of the Salvation Army. But in 1890, after a long and painful illness, the General's never failing helpmate died. She was acknowledged one of the most remarkable women of the 19th century, and to her must go a substantial part of the credit for the founding of the Salvation Army. Henceforth, for 22 more years, William Booth went forward alone. We find him addressing meetings and administering the ever-expanding activities of the army, sometimes tired, sometimes troubled, always feeling the loss of his wife, yet following the same road unflinchingly. But it is a brighter part of William Booth's story at this time that his intense love for his son Bramwell and his complete confidence in his judgment were deepened by the work of those years. As Chief of Staff, Bramwell's wonderful organizing ability contributed greatly towards the steady expansion which was going on at this time. The founder personally began a series of journeys to continue until his last year to see for himself what was being achieved overseas. Here he is traveling on an American train in the year 1903. This was the famous visit during which he was received by President Theodore Roosevelt and invited to perform the ceremony of opening the United States Senate with prayer. In the early years of this century, the motion picture began to come into general use, and from this point onwards, portions of our story unfold in movement. This is a typical London scene in perhaps 1904 or 5, showing a Salvationist meeting assembling outside a public house. Let us catch another glimpse of this world half a century ago in movement. This scene shows traffic outside the mansion house in the city of London. Among the earliest motion pictures of the army's activities that have been preserved are some scenes of the International Congress in London in the year 1904. Coming out of the Congress meeting are some of the thousands who took part. The hall used was a temporary building in the Strand, specially erected for this purpose. taken place since the first Congress 20 years before. Years of consolidation in Britain and tremendous expansion in the many other countries that had been invaded by the army in those two decades. The general, accompanied by Commissioners Cadman, Pollard and Kitching, goes to the saluting base for the great march past. This took place at the Crystal Palace. The general acknowledged contingent after contingent from all parts of the world. To William Booth, taking the salute with such vigorous enthusiasm, the International Congress was an event of great importance, for he believed in associating all the races of the earth together in a common religious enthusiasm. meetings were held, like this one, inside the Crystal Palace. In 
a railway accident in the far west of the United States, the general's daughter, Emma Booth Tucker, known as the consul, was killed in 1903. Her death was a sad blow to him. Her body was brought back to New York, where her funeral took place. toiled for America for eight long years, and it seems to me that she should be laid down in the last long sleep on American soil. She was buried in the Woodlawn Cemetery in New York, where a vast crowd collected. Her passing was mourned not only by large numbers of the United States, but by Salvationists and their friends everywhere. The founder referred to her death as the loss of his left hand. in his 75th year, yet had the courage and determination to inaugurate an entirely new method of campaigning. In the autumn of 1904, he used a motor car to tour from one end of the kingdom to the other. During this first motor campaign, a distance of 1,250 miles was covered. Imagine what this meant in these primitive cars for a man in his 70s. Some people who disapproved of these methods, but on the whole, the imagination of the world was struck with sympathy and approval that this very old man should adopt the latest invention of science at the end of his life's work. country, large numbers gathered to listen to him, for by now, William Booth, who had faced great opposition for so long, had in his old age achieved worldwide popularity. His work was recognized as the work of one honestly inspired by love of humanity. Campaigning by motor car soon became one of the general's established methods. In vehicles like these, he journeyed throughout England, Scotland, and Wales. going was not always without mishaps. A puncture in those days was apparently not very easy to deal with. The general is addressing a great crowd in Wigan but towns both large and small were visited. He afterwards reported that flowers, fruit and kisses were thrown at the party and sometimes five pound notes. Now the general has stopped outside a poor law institution in a wayside village to speak to the people. In 1905, the general set out to visit Australia, spending a few days in the Holy Land on the way. 
Here he is going ashore at Jaffa, where, his journal records, they were received by the cinematograph. He is accompanied by his faithful aide-de-camp, Lawley. The general's program was a full one. He visited the Mosque of Omar, built on the site of Solomon's Temple. At Bethany, he visited the house of Martha and Mary. In Jerusalem, he visited the Wailing Wall of the Jews and gave alms to a beggar. He described the Wailing Wall as one of the most pathetic scenes he had ever witnessed. He entered the Garden of Gethsemane. Here he knelt down and prayed. The climax of his visit to the Holy Land was when he climbed Mount Calvary and read a manifesto he had prepared calling on all who name the name of Christ to follow his example and make a desperate effort on behalf of the salvation of the lost world. This manifesto was reproduced in the press of countries everywhere. The general, arriving home after his long tour, is met by Bramwell Booth, the Chief of Staff, and Commissioner Hay. Later that same year, a great honour befell him. He received the freedom of the City of London at a ceremony in the Guild Hall. This was one of the great occasions of his life. A further honour was conferred on him a year later when he received the order of Doctor of Civil Law of Oxford. And still, as this wonderful old man approached his 80th year, he continued to direct the army personally, as well as travelling tens of thousands of miles each year. In 1907, he visited Canada, Japan and the United States, and while in America, he was invited to the White House by President Theodore Roosevelt. After leaving the White House, he climbs into his motor car. The general is attending to correspondence during the course of his stay in the United States. The pressure on his time increased rather than decreased as he became older. At home and abroad, he rarely had a moment's leisure. The faithful Brigadier Cox, who accompanied him so often and looked after him so well, is in attendance. Evangeline enters with an item of business or a detail regarding the itinerary of his visit to be hastily discussed before departure. They wait for the arrival of the cars. Evangeline Booth was at this time commander of the Salvation Army in the United States, having been transferred there from Canada in 1904. She was later to become the fourth general of the Salvation Army. The car not having arrived, the general steps forward for the benefit of the cinematograph. His worldwide travels continued. Here he is coming ashore at Cape Town during his tour the next year in 1908. He visited other places in South Africa, including Kimberley. At home, his motor tours continued, thousands of miles being covered in this way. In his 80th year, we find him visiting Denmark, Sweden, Finland, and St. Petersburg in Russia. He continued to travel abroad until his 83rd year. His home during the last years was a modest house at Hadley Wood to the north of London. 
he spent many working hours in his study here. On his 83rd birthday, he wrote, Everyone thinks it next door to a miracle that I shall be so young and energetic and capable of so much work. Right up to the end, he was talking of work and thinking of his fellow men. Here he is with his faithful sheepdog, Jip, in the garden of his home at Hadley Wood a few months before his death. His last public appearance was at the Royal Albert Hall in London on May the 9th, 1912. Speaking to 9,000 people, the general said, like a ship, I am going into dock for repairs, referring to the impending operation on his eye for cataract. Towards the end, he became totally blind. On the 20th of August, 1912, William Booth, God's soldier, laid down his sword. He lay in state in the Congress Hall, London. Thousands came to pay tribute. For the last time, he leaves the army headquarters in Queen Victoria Street. Through the streets of London, his funeral procession passed through the city of which he was freeman. The flags of nations invaded by the army were carried proudly at the head of the column. The whole traffic of this metropolis was arrested by one of the densest multitudes that ever thronged its thoroughfares. As the carriage passed the mansion house, the Lord Mayor of London saluted the coffin. Ten thousand men and women from the ranks of the Salvation Army, specially selected to represent their comrades, walked behind their promoted leader, who had taught them to give their lives ministering to the poorest, the lowliest, and the lost. with the passing of this man, one of its great fighters had passed away. Messages of sympathy rained in from every quarter of the globe. Every newspaper of any consequence paid its tribute. No man ever finished his Earth's battle with so universal a triumph. to his burial in Abney Park Cemetery in London. The vast crowd that witnessed the end of his last journey was symbolic of a mightier host. For in the shelters of the army he had founded, thousands of homeless men were finding refuge. In his homes, thousands of women saved from the uttermost ruin were mourning his loss. In every continent, many there were telling each other sorrowfully that the father who had sought them out and rescued them had passed from the world. And in countries as ancient as China and as new as America, tens of thousands were speaking of him as the man who had brought them comfort and strength. And so William Booth was laid to rest. But it is the way of salvationists to see triumph in death, to see it as promotion to a greater glory. And so his son, Bramwell, turns to the great crowd and leads them in singing, Servant of God, well done. His 
study is empty now, and his chair stands vacant. But his work goes on. His followers have carried it to the farthest limits of the world, and many of his unfulfilled dreams have been gloriously brought to pass. The legacy of this army that William Bull, God's soldier, left to mankind is marching vigorously in every clime, sustaining his message of boundless salvation so rich and so free. <laughs>